Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Vortex, where lies and falsehoods are trapped and exposed. I'm Michael Voris. The Church of Nice Crowd, essentially run by a homo clergy, has long portrayed our blessed Lord, as well as famous saints, as emasculated fairies of men, delicate, fragile, soft little things who are very sweet and would never say a word that would offend anyone. That's what you get when you leave the presentation of theology to a bunch of men who either sleep with each other, want to sleep with each other, sexually abuse men in their care, and even sometimes go after boys. There's a line in the movie Gladiator, a movie that is a sure bet most of the fairy clergy either didn't see or hated it if they did see it, where one of Maximus's companions warns him of the evil emperor's plan. You have a great name. You must kill your name before he kills you. And this is exactly the plan of the homo heretics in the church. They are killing the name, the reputation of our blessed Lord in his teachings in an effort to destroy him in his church, which are inseparable. Just as husband and wife cling to each other and the two become one flesh, so too Christ and his bride, the Holy Catholic Church, are inseparably united in mystic bond. So to kill the church is to kill Christ, and to kill Christ is to kill the church. These fairy clergy want the church to change, to accommodate their psychological illnesses. And so they have to kill the name of Christ so that the church's teachings can change to accommodate them. To do this, they have spent a half century distorting who Christ is, presenting a picture completely out of balance with the reality of the God-man. He is portrayed as some milk-toast, queenie-type male who prances around saying wonderfully pithy things like, never judge. In fact, that seems to be the only thing the homo clergy crowd ever repeats of our blessed Lord's words. Homo clergy pom-pom girl Father James Martin is constantly trying to strip our Lord of his divinity, saying heretical things that imply Jesus didn't know that he was God or wasn't in touch with his mission until somebody else down the road kind of pointed it out to him. Yeah, because that's what God needs, a flawed human being to help him figure out how to be God. But this creates a conundrum because the church cannot simply be excised from the world. It needs to exist for them so it can be co-opted by these traitors and used to bring about their socialist globalist rule. So it's actually more about changing the church than ending the church. Ending it would remove a very valuable weapon from their hands. It's why men like Supich blather on about revolution in the church and uh, a paradigm shift. That's the plan, ongoing, right now. Part of all of this is to effeminize anything authentically masculine in whatever arena it can be done. Why? Because the authentic masculine rises up and confronts and destroys this abuse of the sacred. Think about the scene in the temple. The gospel is very specific about this. Not only did our blessed Lord turn over the tables and scatter the ill-gotten gain of the money changers who were giving the religious leaders a kickback, but think about this. He sat down and fashioned a whip, took time there, a scourge, stringing it together, twining it together, strand by strand, cord by cord with his own divine hands. As he was doing this, sitting in the midst of all of that filth, his divine wrath would have been increasing as he sat there watching and hearing the cheating and the lies and the violation of the first commandment and a few others to boot. Then in an explosion of divine justice, he began not just whipping, but scourging this wicked lot who abused the sacred place. In turning over the tables, he set the divine order back in place. My father's house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. What we have running the church today in so many respects is a den of thieves. They steal from Almighty God what rightfully belongs to him, which is souls. They steal from the sheep what rightfully belongs to them, which is truth. And all the while, they sit there at their tables, exchanging the glory of God for the scandal of their sex and finances. The laity can no longer remain quiet about this. It's time to turn over the tables in the temple. 
the money, the sex, mostly homosexual sex, the lies, the distortions of the faith, the cover-ups, the lack of transparency, the refusal to be held accountable, all of it. What a disgusting, wicked display of lack of supernatural faith. And to not be justly enraged by these perversions of God's truth indicates a lack of love in the soul of him who is not rightly moved to indignation. You have been lied to for decades. Your children have been. Your financial sacrifices to ensure an authentic Catholic education for your children have been absconded with and your children left without the faith. Your offerings in the plate have been stolen and used by active homosexuals to live lavish lifestyles and sponge off your goodwill. Your liturgies have been destroyed so as to do a complete makeover of who our blessed Lord is, sissifying him and his saints so you will more easily accept sodomy and homosexuality. They lie, cheat, rape, distort, sexually assault, destroy, and they do it all under the cover of hanging around the precincts of the temple, all the while giving the appearance of religious respectability. One cannot help but think that at this very moment, our blessed Lord is sitting in the midst of all of this, fashioning a scourge. And when the tables are overturned this time, the hypocrites will not just be scourged and driven from the temple, but plunged into hell for their lack of charity. Pray they repent before such a day arrives, but if not, then pray for the scourge to be unleashed because these men must go, and they will not go of their own accord. God love you. I'm Michael Voris.